I'm here talking with NASA scientist Noah Petro about the fast approaching super blue blood moon. So what makes this moon so unusual? So what makes this particular event with the super moon, the lunar, lunar eclipse, and the, the blue moon is that they're happening roughly simultaneously. And so that hasn't happened since December of 1982. And so for these three things to occur on the same time is, is a pretty uh, unusual event. Um, uh, it won't happen again until 2037. And so the, the eclipse is really the most spectacular of the events because those are the ones that are most visually stunning. The supermoon is wonderful because you get to see this slightly larger, brighter uh, moon in the night sky, but, it, but it's really the eclipse that, that is gonna you know, obscure the, the supermoon, if you will. It'll be 14% bigger, 30% brighter when it's not in eclipse. Of course, during the eclipse, the, uh, the, the moon will pass into the Earth's shadow so that brightness will change to that beautiful rusty red color that people are accustomed to seeing during lunar eclipses. So how long can people expect to see this red color during the eclipse? The red color of the eclipse is only gonna occur during the, the totality of the lunar eclipse. Unlike the solar eclipse last summer, where totality happened um, you know, for, for a little bit more than maybe two minutes at most, the, the totality of this lunar eclipse will take place over several hours. Um, and so for folks who are on the west coast of the United States, Hawaii, Alaska, western Canada, eastern Asia, Australia, New Zealand, the eclipse will take place over several hours in the middle, well, either early in the morning here on the, on the western United States or uh, uh, later in the night um, uh, for, for folks who are more in the Pacific. Uh, but uh, so it's, slowly, uh, it's a slowly unfolding event, uh, but should be a really beautiful show. And so what would be the best way you would recommend people to watch it? Well, it depends on where you are. Hopefully it's clear, but no matter uh, what the, the sky clearness is, uh, folks can follow the eclipse uh, unfold live uh, on nasa.gov where we'll be streaming from multiple telescopes uh, out west. The, the real best place for people to go is in their backyard uh, or get together with friends or, or any place uh, you might, might uh, be able to have a clear view of the western sky. So, you know, the, the important thing is getting the timing right. So in the western United States, if you're in the Pacific time zone, anytime between about 4.52 and 6.08, the moon will be in totality. Uh, but you want to have a clear view of the night sky. Obviously, being near uh, a large city, you get a, a beautiful view of the moon rise or setting behind large buildings. But in general, if you want to see the whole event unfold, you want to be away from tall buildings, bright lights, trees, things like that. You want to have a clear view of the western horizon. And is there anything researchers hope to learn by observing the moon during the eclipse? Absolutely. So one of the really exciting things that happens during lunar eclipses, and, and folks who experience the solar eclipse probably felt this happen, where there's this cooling. Except on the moon, because there's no atmosphere, the, the cooling is much more dramatic. You're going from direct hot sunlight into the deep dark shadow of the Earth. And so that rapid cooling of the lunar surface actually can help us understand what the properties of the surface are. Now there are surfaces on the moon that are extremely cold. Uh, the coldest temperatures in the solar system actually have been identified in permanently shadowed craters at the moon. But when we look more at the equator or the rest of the moon, seeing how the moon's surface cools and then reheats when it goes back into sunlight can tell us something about the, the particle size, the properties of the surface that we can't normally get by just studying the normal day-night cycle of heating on the lunar surface. I see. So it's a, it's a broader scale look than, for instance, any samples that might have been brought down from the moon already. Right, and so you know, for the six uh, Apollo sample return sites, those were very specific locations, but we can target during this eclipse other places uh, of interest. And so really what we're studying is the lunar regolith. Now the Apollo samples brought back parts of that regolith, but in general they landed further away from lunar craters, for instance, and so this gives us a chance to explore remotely, either with data from our Lunar Recon Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft or from the telescopic observations that will be made during the eclipse, places that we might want to go in the future or places that uh, were inaccessible to astronauts. <laughs>